And now today's passage, Joel chapter 2, beginning with verse 15. Verse 15. Blow a trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and the nursing infants. Let the bridegroom come out of his room and the bride out of her bridal chamber. Let the priests, the Lord's ministers, weep between the porch and the altar. And let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your inheritance a reproach, a byword among the nations." Why should they among the people say, where is their God? Verse 18. Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and will have pity on his people. The Lord will answer and say to his people, behold, I am going to send you grain, new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied and full with them. I will never again make you a reproach among the nations, but I will remove the northern armor from you and I will drive it into a parched and desolate land, and its vanguard into the eastern sea, and its rear guard into the western sea. Its stench will arise, and its foul smell will come up, for it has done great things. Verse 21. Do not fear, O land, rejoice and be glad, for the Lord has done great things. Do not fear, beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness have turned green, for the tree has borne its fruit. The fig tree and the vine have yielded in full. Verse 23, So rejoice, O sons of Zion, and be glad in the Lord your God, for he has given you the early rain for your vindication, and he has poured down for you the rain, the early and the latter rain as before. The threshing floors will be full of grain, and the vats will overflow with new wine and oil. Then I will make up to you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the creeping locust, the stripping locust, and the gnawing locust, my great army which I sent among you. You will have plenty to eat and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. Then my people will never be put to shame." Thus you will know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and there is no other, and my people will never be put to shame. Would you pray with me, please? Our Father God, we thank you for your grace, for your mercy. We thank you for your promises and your expressions of hope, even in time of despair. We thank you that you call us to repentance, that you call us to return to you, and also that you call us to rejoice in you. Lord, I pray for those who are still suffering. I thank you that uh, most have recovered from our season of illness. I pray for those who are still suffering, that you would uh, encourage them and bless them and raise them up and bring them back to our number. Lord, I thank you for the good monsoon rains that we have had. Lord, we pray for the, the farmers and the ranchers as uh, this is a, a difficult climate for them in terms of the economy. I pray that you would uh, bless and encourage them. Lord, we pray that each one of us would return to you, would repent genuinely, would reach out to you and enjoy your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. The overall story of Job of Joel, the overall context here, the, the tragedy that happened in his time became an illustration for the prophetic points he wanted to make. Chapter 1 discusses the locust swarm that affected that entire region, and it's described in, in vivid poetic terms, and his call is to return to the Lord. In chapter 2, he transitions from the locust swarm and continues using some of the same imagery, but talking about future judgments, including the final judgment, the day of the Lord. And it seems that it was including future judgments well before that, but we know that he's talking about the day of the Lord because some of the ultimate things in the chapter very clearly have yet to be fulfilled. So he's talking about the day of the Lord, and the command is to return to God. And here in this second portion of chapter 2, 
he resumes where he began in chapter two and says, blow a trumpet and call an assembly. Convene the people to come to repentance. So that's a, that's a, a brief review and overview. The, the command and the invitation to return, this is still a review from time before last, uh, Ryan preached last week. From verse 12, the command, return to me, return with all your heart, and with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Return to me. Return to me. God's, God's command, God's standard invitation is to return to him. Return to him. Two weeks ago, when I, when I talked through this passage, I shared with you New Testament passages, including 2 Corinthians 5.20, a great verse, be reconciled to God. This is an Old Testament theme as well. In Deuteronomy, Moses predicted that the people would be taken into captivity. And he says, when that happens to you, return to God. In Samuel, he challenged his people to return to God. Isaiah 55 is a great chapter, a wonderful chapter. God's invitation to return to him in repentance. In Lamentations, Jeremiah calls the people to return to God. In Hosea, there's multiple invitations to return to God. And in the minor prophet Amos, we'll do Amos one of these times. Amos lists a series of judgments, one after another after another, that God had sent on his people. And each one, the refrain is, and yet you have not returned to me. I did this, I did that, I did the other, and yet you have not returned to me. My friends, the message of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is return to God. If you don't know God at all, if you have no relationship with him, you still have a relationship with him as your creator. Return to God. This is the standard invitation, the standard gospel message in the Bible. And why should we return to God? Because God is kind. And again, that's in the review verses from last week. Second part of verse 13 he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, and relenting of evil. You know the story of the prodigal son? Romans chapter 2, verse 4 tells us why we should return to God. Romans 2, 4 says, The kindness of God leads you to repentance. Come back to God because He is kind and merciful. And wants to welcome you in like the prodigal son was welcomed in. Return to God. All of that is review. At the beginning of today's passage, starting with verse 15, the people are called to come together and convene a gathering for repentance. Repentance. Blow the trumpet. Bring them in. Way back when we did the, the beginning of this chapter... I said there's two different words for trumpet in the Old Testament. There were silver trumpets that they were instructed to make. Moses was instructed to make in the book of Exodus. And they were for summoning the people for battle. They were for setting the people out on their marches as they marched across the wilderness or so on. That's not the word here. Blow the trumpet, the shofar, the ram's horn. It was used to convene religious assemblies and this was an assembly for the purpose of joint communal repentance. Blow a trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly. There should be both corporate and individual, both corporate and personal repentance. There's a time for both. Sometimes it's appropriate as a congregation to repent. Sometimes it's appropriate as a nation to repent. Wouldn't it be great if God led our nation to repentance? We all need to repent individually. Let me highlight a couple of, verse, a couple of words that are the same word in the Hebrew, 
But in the Bible I have open in front of me, they're different words. The New American Standard Bible in general does a good job of translating the same word with the same word. But there are exceptions. If you have a King James open in front of you, you'll see the word sanctify both in verse 15 and in verse 16. Consecrate the fast, sanctify the congregation. Those are the same word. They mean to set apart. They mean to make holy. They were to set apart, consecrate a day to come together. There we go. They were to consecrate a day to come together. They were also supposed to set them apart to God. I have a picture there of the tabernacle in the wilderness. Where were all those curtains, all those fences, all those barriers, and the ultimate curtain into the Holy of Holies? What did they represent? They represented God's holiness, God's separateness. We are to be set apart for God. In their circumstances, under the Old Testament rules, we know how they would have gone about consecrating themselves and consecrating themselves corporately to God. It involved religious uh, ritual washings and sacrifices. Well, Jesus is our sacrifice, but we need to be cleansed. In their setting, they were to get rid of anything in the camp that was impure. For Passover, that included uh, uh, getting rid of all the leaven. What do we need to get rid of out, of out of our lives? What do we need to clear out? What do we need to do to set ourselves apart for God, to sanctify ourselves, to cleanse ourselves? That's a key step in repentance. Consecrate the day. Sanctify the congregation. Two different English words, they mean the same thing. To make holy, to set apart to God. Beyond that, <clears throat> notice, read with me verse uh, 16 again. It's poetic, it's kind of interesting. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders. Gather the children and the nursing infants. Let the bridegroom come out of his room, and the bride out of her bridal chamber. Let the priests, the Lord's ministers, weep. What is the point, and I have it up there, what is the point that the author is making with all these poetic allusions to all these different kinds of people coming out of, from their pursuits? Repentance is a priority. I don't know about your family, but in my family, one of the, 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 I'll use the blunt word, sins that several of us are prone to, including myself, is that wonderful one of procrastination. It's easy to see in a certain couple of my offspring, and I'm all too aware of it myself. It's so easy to just not do it right now, do it later, put it off, put it off, put it off. Um, as, a, as a pastor, there's so many things I need to get done, and I have the, the privilege and the responsibility of prioritizing them. Do I prioritize them about how important they are? I should. I have a tendency to prioritize them about which tasks, which ministries I enjoy more and which I enjoy less. My friends, the devil would love to have us procrastinate repentance until we're in hell. Am I wrong? Repentance is an overriding priority. Quit what you're doing and get right with God. That's what the prophet is saying to his people and applies perfectly well to us. Nothing in your life, nothing that you are doing, none of your priorities, none of your daily, hourly, weekly tasks are as important as getting right with God before the day of judgment. Judgment. 
Repentance should be a priority. Look at verse 17. I already read the first part of verse 17. Let them, that's the priest, say, Spare your people, O Lord. Do not make your inheritance a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they among the people say, Where is their God? My wife attended a biblical, conf- uh, biblical counseling se- What's the word I want? Seminar. It wasn't the word that was coming to mind. Seminar um, last week and uh, had some interesting studies and one that, that she told me about kind of plays into this a little bit. How do, you, how do you tell true repentance? It wasn't exactly the theme that she was sharing with me, but how do you tell true repentance? False repentance is all about me. I want to do what I, want to, what I have to do to get out of the problem. I want to do what I have to do to get the spanking over with quickly. I want the whole mess to be behind me and move on. I want, I want. True repentance is God-focused. Here the prophet challenges us to appeal to God's nature. Why should God forgive me for his glory in the case of his children Israel? Why should God forgive me because Jesus paid for my sins? It's about him. And yes, I can cry out to God to forgive me and to remove the judgment. That's the promise in the passage. But it's about God. Before I move on from this series of points about repentance... On two different occasions with two different people, I remember hearing men who were at least regular churchgoers, and at least one of them had grown up as a regular churchgoer. They'd heard God's word taught into their lives over and over again. They're talking to me and they say, I'm not sure I know how to repent. When I hear that from somebody who's heard God's word for years, it reminds me rather chillingly of the verse in Hebrews 12 where it's talking about Esau. I believe it's Hebrews 12, 17. It says, he found no room for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. And I'm thinking, dude, you're in trouble. I don't want any of you to not know how to repent in terms of the how-to. The Bible's full of the how-to. I mentioned Isaiah 55 earlier. James 4 is another good passage. On the reverse side of your sermon outline is a different sermon outline, frankly. It's about repentance. It draws from two psalms and the story of the prodigal son. There's some practical steps there for repentance. You do know how If you find no room for repentance, maybe it's because there's something wrong with your heart. Moving on, got a lot more, a lot more in this passage, and some of it's the 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 good stuff, the the joyful stuff, the cheerful stuff. I don't want to spend too much on the on the doom and gloom. God promises restoration to His people. Look with me at verses eighteen through twenty. Then the Lord will be zealous for His land and will have pity on His people. The Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I am going to send you grain, new wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied and full with them. I will never again make you a reproach among the nations. Verse 20, I will remove the northern army far from you. I will drive it into a parched and desolate land, its vanguard into the eastern sea, its rear guard into the western sea. Its stench will arise and its foul smell will come up, for it has done great things. Jump down with me to verse 24. The threshing floors will be full of grain. The vats will overflow with the new wine and oil. Then I will make up to you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten. The creeping locust, the stripping locust, the gnawing locust. My great army which I sent among you. A lot of interesting things there. Let me highlight, first of all, just the the, the very end of verse 19 I will never again make you a reproach among the nations. 
That's just one of the clues in the passage. Another one's in the next paragraph that we're not getting to today that we can definitely say this has not been ultimately fulfilled yet. This is looking forward to a future, gener- a future fulfillment. This is looking forward to God's kingdom on earth. God restored Judah and Israel any number of times, but they went on to further reproach at different times. So this is ultimately forward-looking, but God wants to restore to them what he had taken from them. Why? Because they are his people because of his mercy, not because they deserved it. I talked about restitution, returning something that belongs to somebody else. For youth group Friday night, we did chariot races. So after church, I've got to take Jerome and Susie's chariot back to their house. You can ask them about it later. Giving back something. Does God have to give anything back to us? No, he does it out of the overflow of generosity. Let me give you a different illustration. A few months ago, my wife's sister, my sister-in-law, was visiting her parents in her Beamer. She's got a very nice car. And the Beamer broke down. So my father-in-law, her dad, arranged for it to be fixed. And he paid for it. Did he need to pay for it? No. My sister-in-law makes real good money at her job, and her husband makes real good money at his job, and, you know, they're, 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 they're well off. But my father-in-law's a generous guy. He fixed my sister-in-law's Beamer, and it was not cheap. My father-in-law's a generous guy. Because they shelled out X amount of dollars to fix Lisa's Beamer, he sent my wife a check for that same amount. Uh, 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 nice check for one daughter, the nice check for the other daughter. Now, what, was, he, was, was he making it up to camp for anything? No. He's a generous guy, and he's got money, so he wrote a check. Uh, 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 further, uh, further distraction on that. I was down at the bank the other day depositing two checks. One was made out to me for $500 from her dad. The other was made out to my daughter for $1,000 from her dad. It's like... How come granddaughter gets twice as much? (laughs) God wants to give to us. God wants to overflow his mercy because of his generosity. It's not something we can earn. It's not something that we can manipulate out of him or arm twist from him or demand of him. He blesses us because he is generous. He blesses us because we are his people in the context of the children of Israel. In our context, do you belong to Jesus? Are you part of his family? Have you been adopted as a co-heir, a sharer of Jesus' inheritance? That's what God has for us. God blesses us because we're his people. And that wonderful promise down in verses 24 and 25, God can make it up to you. And God wants to make it up to you. The King James says, I will restore to you the years. Our text says, I will make up to you for the years. Can God do that? How does that work? My friends, the answer to that question is as infinite as God's power and his creativity, and it's as varied as all our different circumstances. On the one hand, there are irrevocable consequences for sin. If I murder somebody, they stay dead. Right? My dad used to say, God doesn't unscramble the eggs we scramble. That's true. On the other hand, here's the promise to his people that were undergoing a discipline that they deserved. God says, I want to make it up to you. 
How does that work in their case? In their case, it's fairly simple and straightforward. The locust had wiped out everything edible in the whole land, except the locusts themselves. Locusts are edible. How long would it take for a couple of bumper crops to refill their, their, their storage cellars? Remember the story of Joseph in Egypt? There's locusts for you. That's one of Moses' plagues. But um, Joseph in Egypt, seven good years fed, for the, fed the seven bad years. Here the bad years came first. God could restore it to them. A few years later in their history, wicked King Ahaz had sent all the gold and silver in the royal treasuries and in God's temple away to bribe the king of Assyria into fighting the king of Aram for him. And it worked, and then the king of Assyria came and invaded him. Just one generation later, in a time of more war and oppression, King Hezekiah is described as being vastly rich. Hezekiah was a good guy, and God blessed him. God can work it out. We mentioned Joseph. How did God work it out in his life? Was it fair for him to get thrown in a pit and sold as a slave and thrown in jail? None of that was fair. God made it up to him. What about Job? Did he deserve what happened to him? God restored his wealth and his livestock twice over and gave him a second family. He's got both families forever in heaven. Again, the specific way God wants to restore to you in your situation is as varied as your situations. But God is not limited. On the table in the entryway, I have a handout. It's a a Sunday school handout from about a year and a half ago. A handout about how God can turn curses into blessings. How God can turn his own curses into blessings. God can make it up to you. God makes all things to work together for good. Pick up one of those handouts. It's an interesting story on your way out. By the way, some people, some Christians, some servants of God will never have it made up to them in this life. Is it okay with you if you get your eternal reward on the other side? Or do you demand Job's double riches here and now? There are Christian martyrs. There are people dying for their faith in the world today. At the rate we're going in this century, this century is going to be the worst century of Christianity in terms of persecution and martyrdom. Just because we don't have it here doesn't mean it doesn't exist. God can make up to you for the lost years, even if those lost years are a result of your own sin and its consequences. There's a couple of parallel statements that are kind of chilling. Look at verse 20. It's describing the northern army both the army of locusts and possibly an army of people being described, being thrown into the sea. Remember Pharaoh's story? The northern army, God's instrument of judgment, will arise and its foul smell will come up, for it has done great things. See that phrase? End of verse 20. Verse 21, Do not fear, O land, rejoice and be glad, for the Lord has done great things. That's the same phrase, the same two words in Hebrew. The same God that sent the devastating army wants to bless. The same God that is bringing about the day of judgment that's going to be described in the next, couple, the next paragraph, not the next paragraph, the next chapter, wants to bless. The same God who created hell for the devil and his angels is that we're creating the new Jerusalem for you and me. God has done great things. God is capable. God can do it. How should we respond? A simple command at the end of the chapter. Verse 23, Rejoice, O sons of Israel. 
Verse 21, rejoice and be glad for the Lord has done great things. That's the verse where I just was. Rejoice for the Lord has done great things. Verse 23, rejoice and be glad in the Lord your God. We can rejoice for what he's done. Do you rejoice in him? Do you enjoy God? Do you rejoice in him personally? Rejoice in the Lord your God. Verse 26, praise the name of your God. You will have plenty to eat and be satisfied and praise the name of your God who has dealt wondrously with you. We've undergone big family transitions in my family. All of a sudden we are empty nesters except for the daughter's dog. (laughs) And... My wife and I have rather separate eating patterns. I cook dinner that we share one night a week, and she cooks dinner that we share sometimes. But other than that, we we tend to eat separately. And I offer her a slab of my salmon whenever I have it, just for the fun of offering it to her. She doesn't eat fish. So now, just the two of us at home, we tend to be eating different things at different times. We're not sitting formally around the dinner table and, and, and saying grace over the food. This is just one of many verses in the Bible that highlight and emphasize. It's never specifically commanded. Actually, I think it is in Deuteronomy now I think of it. But praise God for your food. When you eat and are satisfied, have you prayed over it? It's really that simple. Rejoice in God's provision. Verse 26, praise the name of the Lord. Verse 27, read it with me, please. Then you will know that I am in the midst of Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and there is no other, and my people will never be put to shame. Know that he is your God. Rejoice in him. That raises the question. Is he your God? Is the Lord God of Israel, the creator God, your God personally? During the worship service, we sang John 3.16, One of the great summaries of the gospel in the Bible. By the way, the book is full of gospel summaries. Look for other John 3.16 verses. It's an interesting interesting thing to watch for while you're doing your, your Bible reading. God sent his son to pay for your sins and mine so that he can be your God in a personal relationship. Is he your God? If not, the command of the passage is repent and return to the Lord your God. Why haven't you got right with him yet? What are you waiting for? You might wait too late. Would you pray with me, please? Lord God, we worship you as the God who has done and the God who does and the God who will do great things. And Lord, we thank you for your mercy that you do not give us what we deserve and your grace that you offer to pour out on us restoration for even the, 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 the deserved disciplines that we go through. Lord, we ask for your grace. We ask for an abundant outpouring of your grace and your power to work through us. We don't ask for comfort, but we ask for you to minister through us and use us gloriously for your purposes. Use us to introduce others into your kingdom here in the Gila Valley. We rejoice in you, Lord, as the passage commands. We rejoice that you are our God. We rejoice in who you are. We rejoice in your identity and in your blessings. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and what he purchased for us. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.
Today's benediction is based on the promise in Philippians 4.19. May God supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Amen. Go with God.